when preparing for this interview, I spent a few hours hunting with my guests methodology just to prepare and ask a bit better questions. But to my surprise, I found a bug even though I was already top three of this program on HackerOne. And even better, by the time I'm recording this intro, I already found two more bugs on the same program. So I don't know what better recommendation could I give you to listen to my interview with Douglas Day. Enjoy. Hello, Douglas. Thank you so much for joining me for the interview today. For those viewers who don't know you yet, can you please introduce yourself a little bit and tell us how did you start with Bug Bounties? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Douglas Day or Archangel on most platforms. Um, I've been doing Bug Bounties since October of 2018. Um, and nice. I got my bounty, my first, my first bounty in December of 2018. Um, what was, what kind of kicked off my journey was I was working at a, uh, a company at the time that had a bug bounty program on hacker one. Uh, it was new relic. I started there, I think that summer and I had never heard of hacker one before joining the company. And I joined their application security team, expecting to look at you know, scan reports and boring uh, security data that nobody cares about, but they threw me onto the hacker one platform and to start triaging bugs that we were getting from real hackers. And it was intriguing because this was a this was a SaaS application that companies were paying a lot of money for, and here were actual vulnerabilities that real hackers were finding, like cross scripting vulnerabilities, or IDORs, or privilege escalations, or paywall bypasses. And I was like, "Wow, this is a this isn't just a sandbox. This isn't a CTF. This is a a real application, and there are real bugs in here." And so after a, a few months of looking at these um, at these reports coming in, I uh, my wife and I were talking and wanting to buy our first house. And I said, okay, well, maybe this is a good opportunity to, to earn some extra money on the, on the side. And I spun up my account in October of 2018. Um, and I didn't have children at the time. And so I would just spend my afternoons and evenings looking for, looking for bugs and got my first one on the Coinbase program, um, in December of 2018. And I, I shudder thinking about it because it was just a, like a rate limit bypass. Um, it was not very exciting at all. It was a low, but it was a $200 bounty and I was stoked and it just got me hooked. And I went into 2019 expecting to, you know, make, make a you know a couple hundred dollars a month, but I almost ended up matching my, my engineering salary just with bug bounty alone in 2019. And that's when I realized that, shoot, this is, there's really something to this. Um, and now fast forward to uh, 2024, and here I am uh, quitting my day job a couple, couple weeks ago and now doing this doing this full time and mixing in a bit of consulting in there to, to have some steady, consistent income, but for the most part doing bug bounty full time. And it's, yeah, it's been awesome. It's been a, it's been a life-changing experience. This yeah, house that I'm, made... I'm standing in right now was was built with entirely <laughs> with bug oh, bounty. Really? So you made so... the achieved the goal that you initially you know set up when starting bug bounty. That's so cool. What what made yeah, you yeah, now yeah. switch the, the the decision make the decision to to go full time? Uh, I think I started getting so I, I built a family, uh, three children now, and my afternoons and, and weekends are less free. And so I found myself getting frustrated that I couldn't spend as much time hacking as I as I wanted to because obviously during the day I want to to dedicate my time to my to the job that I'm being paid to do, and so I found it really difficult to to find time to uh, to do bug bounty. And so I thought, okay, well, what if this was my my full time job and the expectation was that I was I would be doing bug bounty during the day, um, and then get to spend my afternoons and evenings with my with my family. And so I, I uh, started thinking about that a couple of years ago, probably in 2022, um, but just that's, that's didn't work up the decision. courage to. Yeah. Well, yeah, because it, it's scary. It's it's scary. Bug, you know, yeah. I, have a, I have a family and a lot of bills to pay and um, got very comfortable on, you know, United States tech salary. And so quitting my quitting my day job uh, at a, you know, a very well paid paid job and going for something as inconsistent and unreliable as bug bounty was was really scary and so it did take me a couple of years to build up a a very solid uh found financial foundation so, so that i didn't have to worry about money um if i had some slow months and 
and be able to take some risk. And now he, here I am. I, I don't recommend people take as, as long as I did if they decide to make the jump. Um, I think I probably took way longer than I needed to, but um, just I was, I let, I let fear control me for, for longer than I should. What were the the things that you did to prepare yourself once you already made the decision that you went to quit? But I imagine you had a few months still of, of your contract and what did you do in this time? Yeah, so I, I made the decision, I think, uh, in like February of this year. Um, I had just got, gotten back from a uh, the Miami live hacking event uh, with Hacker HackerOne uh, focused on Capital One and I got the, the MVH there and it was a very sizable uh, bounty amount um, or I had made a sizable amount on bounties that event. And I, I realized, okay, this, this is probably doable at this point. I'm, I just had my best month ever, my best event ever. I've been thinking about this for years. I need to make the jump. So how do I make that happen? And so what I did is I, uh, I decided, okay, how much, how much do I need to be able to, uh, give myself like four months of, of runway. And so I took that number, um, just set aside, uh, a couple of stock vests that are, were coming in through my, through my company. Cause I would get paid in, in stock every three months. And so, uh, after two stock vests, one I got in, in March of this year. And then when I got in June of this year, um, I just set those aside to be used as a four months of runway and, uh, waited, uh, waited until I got those stock vests and then, and then put in my notice. And so that's what I did to prepare, just set aside four months. I have, I, if I only had those four months, I don't think I would have had the courage to, to make the jump, but I have also built up a, a pretty solid you know, safety net of investments such that I can, my family can last significantly longer if we need to. I just would rather not touch those investments. So, so this, this, this like four months of runway is just uh, in my checking account, ready to be, to be pulled from it at the beginning of every month. So, at the, you know, on uh, July 1st, I took, or on August 1st, I'll take, you know, however much money that I need for, for one month and then move it from that, that envelope into my, uh, into my current expenses. And then I'll just spend the first couple of weeks of, or the first week or week or two of, of August building that back up and then saving and investing the rest after that. So that's kind of my strategy going forward, just filling up the, my runway for the next month and just to make sure that I always keep four months of, of, uh, yeah. build up, and then, and then anything extra I save and invest and, um, we'll probably look to buy, look to buy my next house in the next few years. And so save up towards that or put money towards, uh, you know, a, a rental or some other expense that we need, like a family vacation or something. So. Yeah, for, for me it's still some. I, I I want to do it like this that I just have the account from which I pay myself the same amount every month, but I, I've never got, got, gotten to do it, and it's just a bit chaotic because also I have different types of income for different accounts. One thing is on PayPal, the other is in the bank account, and it's just you know when when I my normal account runs out of money, I transfer from one of these accounts. But I really think it's smart to just you know pay yourself a salary just like you would be employed and then when you earn put it into this this account and, and have it like organized a little bit less and i probably should think about it do you do you have a family so that's what made no. me have to get organized <laughs> yeah, then, yeah 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 and, a, a lot more responsibilities yeah that's that's true yeah and uh yeah uh, also with with free children i understand your decision because because i imagine you just had no free time left when you do did bag bounty as a hobby after hours so so yeah i see mm, okay let's let, let's get more into into hacking itself uh what is what is your hacking style what are your favorite vulnerability classes yeah so i i'd say over 50 percent of my bugs are privilege escalations um and then maybe another 30% are IDORs. Uh, I, I really like privilege escalations because they're really hard to protect um, against. And endpoints typically have to be fixed or patched on a per endpoint basis. And so there's not there's not as many holistic fixes to, uh, to privilege escalations, especially if you've got a very complicated permission structure. Um, I know you were DMing me uh, before this, before this call about something that you, like you went and found and, and sure enough, you know, you just took a look at 
okay, well, you got a user with with this permission. Can they hit this endpoint? And I mean, that's my that's my bread and butter. And so I, these there's just so many applications, especially in this world of of SaaS, where you've got uh, you know five different permission levels, and then maybe like three hundred different endpoints that a user can make, and then you just go through and find the ones that you're not supposed to be able to call. And hopefully it leaks a lot of information or it does something that's impactful. And if it can bypass like a, an organization boundary or a tenant boundary, such that you can like affect people that you're not supposed to be working with, then that's even, that's even better. And that'll increase the, increase the impact. And so that's, that's mostly what I, I look for. I've been, I've been on a kick lately of doing, uh, like uh, payment bypasses or price manipulation. And so I've been looking at store applications and trying to get myself things for free just because they're really fun to talk about. Um, yeah. In fact, I found a really cool one yesterday uh, and <laughs> which uses a, like a concept of like uh, loyalty or reward points. So like the more you buy on a particular store, you like get credit uh, to be able to get discounts. And so, you know, you might spend like, a hundred dollars and then your next purchase you get like one dollar off or if you spend you know two hundred dollars you get two dollars off on your next purchase and i i found a way to basically generate unlimited points so that you can get everything for free uh, and so i've been i've been doing a lot of those recently just because they're fun to talk about with friends and family you know if you're if you're at a party and you you're talking about hacking to somebody who's not really technical or isn't in the bug bounty space you know you could say oh i got process scripting or I got RCE and they'd be like, okay, whatever. But if you tell them that, oh yeah, you can buy, you know, free alcohol for life. Um, then they're like, oh, that's awesome, dude. You need to, you yeah. need to teach me how to hack so I can get myself some beer. And it's, uh, it's, it's just way more, way more fun to talk about. I've been, in addition to price manipulation and uh, payment bypasses, I've also been doing a lot of uh, blind XSS. Um, that's been kind of a, a vulnerability that's newer to me. And I just found maybe like my second one ever a couple of weeks ago, but it was, it was just super fun because it's, it's like a, a treasure hunt, right? You never know if you're going to be getting, you know, getting like a callback and you just put the, put the uh, blind XSS payload in different input, input fields. And then suddenly, you know, a few days later, you see some admin panel pop up on your, on your XSS hunter and you're like, Whoa, it looks like that, you know, that request I made three days ago, finally hit somebody. And now I can, you know, delete any account in the application. And so the, the, um, the impact is typically pretty, pretty high. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course, for, for people that, uh, that, that watch, watch the interview, I obviously prepare a lot for, for the interview. I knew that the Douglas style includes a lot of looking for privileges collection bugs. So yesterday I decided what better way to prepare for the interview than to just spend a few hours hacking in this way. So I just opened the application that I was quite familiar with. And I, to be honest, I never tested authorization because it is a lot of work. Like when you talk about it sometimes in podcasts, like, yeah, I just do a matrix of, of roles and, and permissions. And it sounds like a few checks. But when you take a look at how many roles there are, how many permissions there are, and how many endpoints are in a single functionality, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. And uh, that's why also why I didn't do it a lot in the past. But yesterday I decided, you know, I, I will give it a go. And, and just in a few hours, I found a bug. To be honest, I feel like I've cheated a little bit because there was a, a lot of endpoints and I was, mm, it's an open source target. So I, I look at the source code that how do they check for authorization? It's also one of the reason that, that it is actually what you mentioned that it is really hard to, for example, write a scanner rule to detect authorization privilege bypasses or authorization bypasses. Cause it's like, it's never the same. Uh, but I just looked kind of almost manually at, at how do they check permissions on different calls. And I saw some strange logic and that's how I found the bug uh, and it's already three years. So, so, so thank you for this. But, uh, if my first question, how do you get the persistence to check through, as you said, hundreds of endpoints with different roles? So I typically will have a pretty good idea after maybe like an hour of testing whether or not it's going to be very fruitful. Like if, if, if I don't find anything in an hour and I'm like, okay, it looks like they, 
they're doing a pretty good job in general, then I'm not going to spend, you know, another eight hours just grinding and banging my head against the wall because I don't have that kind of persistence. But I mean, when you, when you're finding a bug every like hour or 90 minutes or you know, half an hour, um, it just gives you that, that excitement and that rush to just keep going for like another, another hour or two. It's like, Oh, I bet there's another endpoint. Oh, I bet there's another endpoint. I bet there's another endpoint. And then maybe eventually you'll hit a point where it's like, okay, I haven't found any in a while. Um, they've probably gone through and done like a, a manual check to, you know, or a manual review internally to see, okay, this this has been a, a systemic issue. Let's fix them all. And then that'll kind of make me move move targets. But um, I guess finding finding bugs continually finding bugs is what keeps me keeps me motivated but but yeah if i'm if i'm not finding things i'm not gonna just sit there and grind for eight ten twenty hours you know, just because there's a lot of endpoints um unless they happen to pay a lot for for these types of bugs and so uh, i can talk more about specific programs that i really enjoy for this um it's a public program and so i, I i'm fine talking about it but i've had a lot of fun uh, hacking on GitHub, and GitHub has a very complicated uh, permission structure, and they do a very good job of validating permissions. But when each, when you know, when every single medium severity privilege escalation pays you like four thousand dollars, that's a, you know, that's a, a, more than a lot of programs pay for criticals. <laughs> and so yeah. it's, I don't, I don't mind grinding for, you know, for five, six, seven hours to find a a four thousand dollar medium because that's that's worth it when it comes to to my time. But obviously if it's a smaller program and they're only paying five hundred dollars for each medium severity privilege escalation, then it's I'm gonna move on pretty fast if I'm not finding stuff. Yeah, from your perspective, are there any patterns in what what types of privilege escalations are usually possible? Because for example, from my perspective, when I had less experience I probably would skip the deletion endpoints. I would like think definitely about the read endpoints, the which are quite obvious, about you know creating endpoints, post put endpoints. That would probably like not really consider the the delete endpoints. How does it look from your perspective? Yeah, I'd say there's been, there's been a number of times where I found a an endpoint like the put endpoint is protected, the get endpoint is protected, but for some reason the the delete endpoint hasn't been protected. And so I will, yeah, I will always, always check deletion as well. Um, what's been really interesting is when uh, like the put endpoint is protected, but they also have a patch endpoint, which does the same thing. Um, and then you can kind of bypass the protection on put by just doing patch instead. And so those are, I see that's not very common, but when you find something, find something like that, it's, it's pretty exciting and pretty cool. Yeah, uh, and also uh, you said GitHub. I think GitHub is uh, also as much interesting that by default you have the functionality of pull requests. So different users have some way to to interact with different users, which um, I I think usually makes the attack more more likely because there is the attack scenario of of you know attacking a user that's completely anonymous. Because the other the other thing that that I wanted to ask you is about the the usual risk because. Often, for to escalate privileges, we we need to already have some privileges, which usually makes these these vulnerabilities um, highs or or mediums or maybe sometimes even lows. Uh, so, what 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 do you think, and where should we look for for these uh, higher risk, more more risky bugs? Yeah, so I'd say there. That's a good question. Um, their privilege escalations can usually get up to critical when they are combined with when, when there's also like an IDOR vulnerability. And so it might not be very critical if like a read only user of your own company can uh, you know, read confidential data. But if there's also an IDOR there where a read only user from a company can, can read admin data from another organization, then that's kind of going to be what bumps it up to bumps it up to critical. Um, or occasionally there will be like a, like an application that has like free sign up, but has a like special elevated permissions for uh, like staff or, um, 
or admins that's like specially granted. Um, I was just hacking on a on a program recently where anybody could sign up and use the application and create their own org. But then there was also like another layer of super users, and so that I don't know how they got their permissions. Like some of them are are staff, or maybe they're just have to like apply, and it's a paid position. I don't know, but being able to kind of cross that additional boundary. And so, yeah, you can be an admin of your own org. So what, but if you can, as an admin of your own org, become a super admin or do super admin abilities to affect other orgs, then that's, that's going to be what, what bumps up to critical, but you're right in that, that most, most privilege escalations that I report are going to be medium or high severity, um, occasionally some lows. Um, I wish I was like Alex Chapman and, you know, just spat out criticals. Like it was a, you know, no big deal. But I guess uh, if you look at my my bug bounty resume, m- most of my bugs are, my, or my my most submitted type of bug is medium, followed by like highs and lows are kind of the same, um, and then criticals are are uh, much lower. Yeah, but on the other hand, I think you submit way way more bugs, and it's also some a good way to differentiate yourself because I feel like it's it's very cool to say uh let's say in an interview like this that that someone only looks for for critical bugs uh which alex is a very very specific case let's let's put it aside because he's he looks for very very specific types of bugs but a lot of people say that they they focus on on highs and, and criticals and the thing is when you say me that tell me that you know you, you find a bug every half an hour one hour one half one and a half hour you, I imagine you just have a, a big volume of of reports, and that's that's what generates the the money, and that's also just a different way to 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 earn the same salary potentially. Right, right, um, yeah, and it helps that I look at I look at smaller programs mostly. Um, most of my time is spent on smaller programs that don't pay as much, but are are generally more vulnerable. And so I I'll say, last week I think I submitted five or six or seven uh, vulnerabilities um, whereas you know someone who only focuses on focuses on criticals might you know, submit one bug every two weeks and then you know make like fifteen thousand dollars per uh, per bug that they you know report and that's that's just not me most of my yeah. most of my crits are three thousand dollar crits <laughs> how do you write reports because i imagine for with with this um style you spend much more time writing reports so what do you do to make to make it as quick as possible you know i've heard of hackers who use like uh chat gpt to write reports for them um i haven't gotten to that level of automation i think it's really cool and i probably should um hacker one recently introduced uh well i guess maybe last year uh introduced uh templates and so you can if you report one specific type of vulnerability, then um, like say you're just report a lot of XSS and you can just like use a template and replace the values with like the endpoint and the payload. Again, I, I this is probably a, uh, my Achilles heel. I, I think this is a an underutilized area for me that I could definitely improve on because I, I do just manually, manually write all of my reports and I try to be clear and I try to just list out the steps very like, concisely and um it's worked but yeah i think now that i'm moving full time i'm very open to change and open to improvements and i think this is going to be one of those key key skills that i have not developed uh that needs to be developed yeah although with, with the templates on hacker and i think I, I imagine triazers have seen these templates so many times already that they just skip through any text that's there and can probably, uh, you know, say it from from their memory. So I don't know personally. I I don't use it as well. My reports are often quite short these days, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know how about ChatGPT. I know that a few days ago Justin Rhinorator uh, released some tool that uses ChatGPT um, or, or AI in general to generate reports. I haven't haven't tested it yet. Maybe that's the way, but uh, yeah, uh, for me as well, I, I just do manually. And and I think if you're concise, it doesn't take as, as much time, but we'll see, it should right. definitely make it quicker. 
I, I did have an interesting experience recently where I was writing a report for a, just a pen test I was doing, just like uh, for consulting work. So no relation to bug bounty at all. They had just paid me to, uh, to take a look at some web applications and, and write reports. And it dawned on me that like how much I take for granted that uh, triage teams, whether they're hacker ones triage or the program's triage, typically know enough about security to be able to parse just a very concise report. Whereas when I'm writing this, when I'm writing this report for a, like what was effectively the, the CISO um, and, you know, maybe the, like the director of engineering, like these are less technical, but still very influential roles that I had to kind of change how I was writing my report. Um, like I couldn't just say there's an XSS on this endpoint, you know, which where I might do in, in like a hacker one report, I had to say, okay, if you go to this endpoint as this type of user and you do this payload, uh, it'll show an alert box. However, with XSS, it's not just about, and you know, it's not just about showing an alert box. This effectively gives the attacker control over the JavaScript in the the victim's the victim's browser and is it you know basically browser takeover. And so I kind of had to explain like the impact a bit differently, uh, just because I wasn't going through a bug bounty platform, and that was a really really unique experience. And so writing reports took me a fair bit longer because I was just having to, to, to write them differently and be more, uh, you know, ex explain the context and the, the impact of, of vulnerabilities a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. We've spoke about exactly the same thing with Alex because uh, me as well as a pen tester, I was used to writing these, these reports, you know, to developers that maybe have not heard about a particular vulnerability class. And so the, the report had the explanation of, of what happens. And then when, when doing yep. live parties, I would just, you know, default to doing the same. And only, only, you know, with, with some experience, I, I get to realize I don't need to do this anymore. Right. Right. And my, I guess my experience is like the opposite, right? Cause I started in like doing bug bounty or just writing, you know, really short, you know, three line reports. Like, yeah. hey there, there's an XSS on this endpoint. Go here and you'll see the see the alert payload. Whereas if I'm delivering like a pen test report, I can't do that. I have to say, I have to explain <laughs> what, like the, I have to explain the impact more rather than just trusting triage to understand the impact. And so I kind of had to, rather than shortening my reports, I had to make them longer in a, in a pen test. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, at least uh, I imagine as, as you're doing them as a freelancer, I imagine you, you have the freedom of choosing the format. Often when you work in a company, you have to do it yep. in Microsoft Word and keep the template and it always uh, yeah. breaks and it is just horrible. Yep. And I remember yep. also I just trying to automate generating uh, reports for DocX. It was just a horrible experience. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's terrible. I just make a, make a markdown file in Obsidian and convert to PDF and then send it. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, that's what I do as well. Well, that might be uh, notion, but yeah. But speaking of, of, of noting programs, when you want to be more meticulous and you want to note the, the permissions and, and what you've checked and what you're going to check, how does, does exactly uh, your noting style look like? Yeah. So I'll, I'll typically just use a, just pull up like a city and like file and I won't structure it in any way, but if there's like an endpoint that I want to check, I'll just copy and paste it there. And I'll typically remember what the context is around that, around that endpoint. Um, if there's a, a, a UUID that I need to test and I want to like save it somewhere, I'll slap it into, into the, you know, the markdown file. If there is a, uh, just like user IDs or order IDs or any type of ID, just like put it there. And then I might make like a little note that says like uh, admin ID or uh, read only ID um, and just kind of just keep basically use it as like a scratch pad um, just so that I don't have to like remember, remember numbers or, or remember endpoints. Um, and so it's not, it's not super mature. It's not like I'm saying, all right, I tested this and this, 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 and this, and now I'm going to, you know, tomorrow I'm going to modify my, modify my testing approach by, uh, looking for this type of vulnerability on this type of functionality. And so it's, I use it more just as I, as I would like a piece of pen and paper when I'm basically just hold this information. So I don't have to have it in my brain while I do some testing and then I'll pull it back later. Yeah. And, and more specifically when you are already testing, do you, do you have an organized way you, you, you keep cookies for one user cookies for a different user? Yeah. Do you use repeater tabs? How does it look like? Cause also yesterday when I was. Yeah. 
I was testing it. It it sounds like something easy to handle, but it was also like, oh, this cookie does no longer work. I forgot from which user was yeah. this cookie, and there's a lot of problems like this. So if I if I had Kaido up, so I, I use Kaido, but if you're using Burp Suite, whatever. Um, but I had it up uh, just this morning, and I think I had something around like 200 tabs. Um, and I'll usually not use most of those old ones. But what I do is say say I'm looking at an application, and there's two types of users, right? There's like low level user and admin user, and I want to test for privilege escalations. I'll make a single request with like my lower level user, uh, send it to the repeater, and just rename the tab uh, lower user or lesser user or whatever. And I'll just keep that keep that tab there. And then I'll go through as an admin user, just look at all the endpoints and send them all to the repeater. And so I've got, you know, my first tab is lower user. And then I've got like, maybe like after testing, like a, or just going through like one piece of functionality, I might see like 10, 10 tab after that, which were all made by the admin. And I'll just start from the latest, grab the endpoint, paste it into the, into the uh, lesser user tab. Uh, try that. If it doesn't work, then I'll close that. Uh, close that admin tab and move to the next. If it does work, I'll rename the tab to bug. So I'll just change it and write bug okay. so that I remember there's a bug there. And I'll move to the next one, try it. If it works, change the tab name to bug. And then uh, uh, if not, I'll just delete the, delete that tab. And then once I've got a bunch of bugs, like bug tabs, I'll go through and I'm ready to report. I'll go through and report and then change the change the tab name from bug to reported so that I know that I have, I have reported it. And that's just kind of how I keep track of, okay, here's the, here's the, the different privilege escalations that, that worked. Um, and here's, here's, um, the ones I've reported so that I don't uh, forget something. Yeah, and then yeah, it's, cool. yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty rudimentary, but it, uh, it works for me. There might be a more mature way to do it, but I really, it's, it's worked really well. Just using, just using tabs as my, uh, as my organization structure. Yeah, I wish, uh, I also started using Kaido. I wish there was a feature like in Postman. I don't know if you've ever used Postman, but then you can sort of define mm -hmm. on the collection level variables like cookies, authorization headers, some variables. I wish there was a feature like this and I could have like a set of, let's say this is UUID of some item in admin that I shouldn't access with a low privilege user, one place where I could just change the cookies and stuff like this. I feel like this would be... This would be a key difference uh, to implement it. That would be, yeah, that would be super cool. I know that the Kaido team has been really good. I mean, this, I don't think this is sponsored by Kaido, and so I don't mind talking about it. Um, no, we can uh, talk about it. It's, it's, the it's Kaido cool. team has I, been... I really like it. I started using it like, like months ago, and, and I really like it. So we, we sh if we like it, we should do the, the best job to promote it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. They And the team is very responsive to, uh, to any bugs or feature requests. And so they've... Yeah, if you, I might, you know, either you or I should make that a make that a feature request in a, in their GitHub uh, repository because they're generally pretty responsive and the team is really great to work with. Yeah. Uh, also, what's your browser setup or, or multiple tabs? I imagine with two users, you can just use the normal tab and the uh, incognito tab. But what happens if there are let's say yeah, three different roles? Yeah, so <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, so I, I use Firefox and I will have typically one type of user in my Firefox and then I'll open incognito, have another type of user. If I happen to have to go to three, then I'll open up Chrome and I've got Chrome configured to go through a, go through a proxy as well. Um, but that's, that's less common. Or I'll just try everything with my incognito type user, close that out, reopen it, and then try it, try it with uh, the, the third type of user. But yes, t t I generally just test two types of, uh, of users, users at a time, uh, just one in Firefox and the other in, in incognito and in the, you know, also in, in Firefox. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a simple solution. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious, do what do you do? And, and part of this, uh, I do, I know there is, uh, I think for Firefox, there is like tap colorizer, something like this. And then you can, uh, although they just don't, don't use Firefox, um, some, I use the, the Chrome profiles. So when I use Chrome, I have different profiles for different users. And in Burp, like when I use Burp, I also had different user agents for them and different colors in Burp for these requests. So it was really nice. But now in, in Kaido, I just do, 
Um, I just did, did basically the same. I just did the normal window and then community window. And for two users, it was, it was enough. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So similar to me. Yeah. Do you automate any part of the, of the process? No. And I really should, man. Uh, I, I see so many audit, like automation hackers and they're just able to crush it. And I, I'm stuck in this situation where it's like, there's a learning curve to implementing like automation type solutions. Um, but now that this is my full-time job, anytime that I'm not hacking and in the way that I know best is, you know, costs me. And so it's like, Oh, do I want to take, do I want to take a week where I'm going to effectively or most likely be making no money because I'm not, I'm not hacking the way that I know how to hack to learn a new skill set, which is, probably going to make me make me more money in the long run but it's just you know scary making that making that decision to to invest that invest the time when uh you know i try to keep up uh some bounty quotas to be able to to just keep my keep my lifestyle and, and invest in the things i want to invest so it's uh i'm, I'm sure that that'll that'll come with time um but yeah there's so many so many things i'd love to i'd love to automate whether it's just having like a good fuzzing setup where, uh, cause I feel like there's, there's hackers that are finding easy, easy vulnerabilities that I'm just not finding because they're able to, you know, find endpoints that, um, I'm, you know, just don't show up in the UI, right? Like they might find like an actuator endpoint, which they're able to, you know, restart or shut down the entire application. It's like, that's awesome. That's a critical that I'm not going to find because I'm not scanning for it. And so there's so many cool, so many cool ways to, to improve. It's just a matter of taking the time to, to pull the trigger and, uh, I'm getting there, but I'm not, I'm not going to pretend to be the, the world's best hacker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what, what you mean with investing time. Cause I, I recorded an interview with, with Joe, with TechnoGeek a few days, a few days ago, and he, mm -hmm. he does mobile hacking a lot. And, and so I was like, yeah, let, let's try. So I spent like two days, two, two full days of work trying to bypass SSL pinning on my mobile app. And I still didn't do it. <laughs> it felt like, yeah. oh my God, it felt so bad. But then, but with automation, yeah, but you know, I feel you like, know that there are vulnerabilities there. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. It is, it is the, the customer of the H1702. I don't know if the mobile app would be in scope, but I was, okay. I wanted to just, yeah. you know, make a head start to do it a little bit earlier, but with with automation, I think this is so far off what would I what I want to do that it's not even tempting to me to to try. Oh, yeah. um, but for you, uh, I, I wanted to ask if you are thinking about automating like the the things that usually these hackers automate, like you mentioned actuator, or you would like to somehow automate testing for for the privilege escalations for for your bread and butter, basically. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think the, uh, so when I look at the, the really heavy automation hackers, I feel like the things that they are successful with are things like subdomain takeovers and are finding like or in asset discovery, like maybe finding some endpoint that or some uh, like old service that's running on some obscure subdomain that contains like business critical information. And so that's, I guess that's probably the most attractive to me. Um, I could try to like come up with a automation automation solution to, to test my bread and butter, but then I feel like it would stop being my bread and butter. Um, like I, I feel like I'm, I'm very good at finding these privilege escalations and IDORs and I kind of would like to keep, keep doing that because it's fun. Um, and so if I can throw on some automation to find stuff that isn't as fun for me to, to hack, then maybe that's the, maybe that's the key, you know, going through and like looking at, looking at various subdomains and doing like clicking on every single subdomain that shows up in like Shodan, you know, it's, it's pretty tedious work and it's not very exciting to me, yeah. but if I can have automation to do that for me, then I've kind of got, I've got my blind spot covered. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. There's this, but also that one thing that I, I notice in, in these interviews is that everyone from the top has just is good at uh at ignoring parts that they are not good at and like let's say Alex is is ignoring the the web parts of the application basically uh other people have just you know their, their vulnerability class so uh, 
when I, I feel less and less the the need to do everything sometimes when especially like maybe now even in the in the ambassador world cup when we did a little bit more collaborations i saw oh wow this guy does this oh why what does that guy does that and i'm like never doing these things i'm like oh i should probably do more but then you know it's it's still good to 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 keep something that's that that you're a specialist at and just ignore all the rest it, it's funny that you bring up Alex and collaboration, and maybe this is a good a good segue into a, a collaboration discussion. Um, but cl- collabing with Alex, I've done it a number of times. It's it's always a really cool experience because we are just such like such different hackers, and so yeah. we'll I'll be like working with him on a on a live event, and you know from his perspective, he'll go to sleep and he'll wake up with you know nine collaboration like invites. He's like, what? How, how, you found nine bugs while I was sleeping? And I'm like, yeah, but they're, you know, just all privilege escalations or they're all idors or, or all whatever. Um, and then from my perspective, you know, I'll be like the only one finding bugs for a couple of days. And then suddenly like an internet breaking vulnerability will like show up in my, in my inbox and I'll read through it and have to like read through it seven or eight times and be like, goodness how did you find how how on earth did you find this and he's like oh you know i just i just went down a rabbit trail and and didn't uh uh didn't sleep much but you know here's this way that i can you know steal any website on the internet i'm like goodness gracious dude that's that's amazing and so it's it's really it's really fun collaborating with alex just because we hack in such different ways that i know I know we don't have any crossover. Like I'll, I'll collab with, with people who are also like web app hackers and um, are really good at finding IDORs and privilege escalations. And a lot of the reports we all find or they'll find has been like, Oh, I should have found that. Or like, Oh yeah, I would have found that when I, when I, uh, uh, when I eventually got to that piece of functionality. And so collabing with them just allows for more surface area. You know, we're basically acting as the same person, just testing two different apps at the same time or two different pieces of functionality at the same time. But te- uh, hacking and collabing with Alex is just something completely different because we're we're just hacking on two different like two different planes. Um, I'm yeah. finding vulnerabilities that he's never going to look for um, because you know they they aren't as interesting to his uh, you know wizard brain, and he's finding things that I would lose patience testing for like days or you know hours or days before. Uh, before he does and so he'll like get hooked on something and and know there's a vulnerability there and spend days working on it and eventually it'll you know come to fruition and i'll I'll have like moved on days before him and so because of that i don't feel like there's really any overlap and alex and i can look at the same web page and the same piece of functionality and find completely different bugs because we're just two different hackers yeah yeah if if i were to find Um, two most distinct hacking styles of anyone that I know, I, th- I think you two are the perfect example. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think yeah. it's like, it, it's as far away as, as it's possible. So how do you then, how, what's your model of co- collaboration then? And what's the reason of the collaboration then? So c- collaboration for me is first and foremost, I think it makes it fun. Like bug bounty is a lonely world. You're working by yourself all the time, typically. Um, and it's just, it's it's so much more fun to, to like share ideas and share vulnerabilities that you find with people, especially when you know vulnerabilities that you find are also going to get you paid. And so it's less about like trying to min max and find like the perfect team to be able to find every single type of type of vulnerability on it on an application to get the most amount of money. And it's more about who who am I going to want to be chatting with on Discord or Slack for you know eight hours a day for two weeks? And it's, it's going to be the people that, who are just cool to work with and who are are fun and easygoing and and you know i typically will know what they're doing but for the most part it's like who who do i want to be my coworker right now and that's kind of how i choose my choose my collaborations it's it's people that i just enjoy enjoy working with and uh yeah and so typically before like before a live event i'll um, I haven't been doing this recently because I've been kind of wanting to go out on my on my own this year and see how I can do on live events. But historically, what I've done is before a live event will start, before we even know the scope, um, or occasionally after we know the scope, I'll reach out to you know this person and this person and this person and say, hey, 
do you guys want to team up for this for this live event? And I mean, most people are really excited to team up because it's just it's fun, you know, getting on a getting on a call like on Zoom or or Discord or or whatever and across time zones and just looking at stuff at the same time on like on a call is I mean it's 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 the best type of hacking. It's there's there's nothing that beats it because when you when you're I, I guess being in person beats it, but when you're looking at something at the same time and you find a vulnerability with someone and they're on a call with you and you can both like react at the same time be like oh oh you know we're able to uh, we're already able to you know escalate to admin can we escalate to super admin oh it works oh this is so awesome and, you know and they're like right there with you it's yeah it just not, nothing beats it and so it's it's about it's about fun um that's that's yeah. pretty much why I, why i collab yeah, and then so the model of this is you just agree to to team up for a life hacking event and and you split all the boundaries equally. Is this that's right? right? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Um, I've heard of people getting burnt and not, you know, having somebody on their team who just doesn't collaborate and doesn't, um, you know, doesn't pull their weight. And I I don't know. I feel like once you, once you're at the level where you're going to live events, um, you know, everybody who gets invited to a live event knows what they're doing. You're not gonna and hopefully everybody who goes to a live event, especially if they've been to multiple, aren't just there to to make some quick cash and uh, you know be a jerk. Like people people are at these live events because they love hacking and they love the hacker community. And the last thing that they want to do is to you know create bad blood between two hackers. And so I've I haven't I I've been like the under contributor um, on some events. Um, and I've been the over contributor on some events, and I think it kind of evens out, especially if you collab as a team over you know multiple multiple events. You know, maybe if you collab with someone multiple times in a row and they just don't part, you know contribute, then you can just stop collabing with them on future events. But I don't know. I think I, I think it would be kind of petty to to give somebody a hard time, especially if they were trying because they didn't you know find vulnerabilities or because you found more than them. It's just like, I mean, this is, this is bug bounty that we all, we all like the game. We all like the community. It's, it's way more fun to just, you know, just work together and, and enjoy the experience than squabble over, Oh, this person, you know, cost me $3,000 in, in bounties because they, you know, didn't find as much as, as me. It's like, you know, whatever. Um, I was actually just talking to another hacker. Uh, I was talking to Michael Ten Twenty Six, who had who had done a collab and uh, and they the, with somebody and and we were talking about how weird it is that in Bug Bounty the money almost doesn't feel real, like it feels like monopoly money when you can just be like, oh um, yeah, I'll go ahead and give you you know. 30% because you told me about some endpoint that I wouldn't have otherwise discovered when like in reality, you know, 30% might be $3,000 on a $10,000 bounty. And so you're just casually saying, yeah, you can have $3,000 for helping me. Like in what other industry do people like, so like frivolously just throw a ma throw around money in, in collaborations. It's, it's, it's really unique. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. Have you ever got to a, a point where you had, let's say, a difficult conversation with somebody that, that let's say, you call up in the past and then you decided you, you, you don't want to call up with this person? Um, I've had I've had moments where I've reached out to somebody and said, like, hey, like maybe maybe they reached out wanting to collab and I'd had to say, like, I'm actually going to go solo this event or I'm actually going to work with these people this event. Um, whether or not that was because they contribute, you know, under contributed in in a previous event, or uh, because I just really wanted to try collaborating with these new people, um, you know, I've had both. Um, but I say that's kind of the the closest or the the most the most difficult conversation I've had is just saying like, no, I'd I'd rather not collab this event after somebody reached uh, reached out. Um, I've uh, yeah. Yeah. How, how does the collaboration model look like for Ambassador World Cup? Because you're also an ambassador for the US team there. Yeah. It's, it's a way bigger group. And, and also, I assume not everyone spends as much time. Not everyone is uh, 
uh, as you said, for the life hacking event, the, the group is 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 pretty pretty selective. For the World Cup, it it yeah. changes how does the collaboration model look like there. Yeah, so I think there there are lots of people we're collaborating within our team, and I think typically it's because they like they we know each other's skill set. I had um, a Stealthy reach out to me um, about a particular asset because he knows I'm really good at at purple escalations and permission bugs. And so he's like, Hey, I found this, I found this, uh, this particular application, which I don't think anybody else has discovered yet. It looks like it's got a, a complicated permission structure. I'm going to invite you to it. And you know, any bugs you find, will just, we'll split. Uh, and so, yeah, I was able to, uh, surprisingly, I didn't actually find any permission bugs, but I found a number of XSS. But um, we still, uh, yeah, it, any bugs that we found on that application, we we split together. And it was just because he knew that I'm good at, at privilege escalations. And, I mean, similarly, if I find something that looks like it might be vulnerable to request smuggling or or uh, RCE, then I kind of throw it his direction. And then, you know, uh, Nahamsek is really, really good at blind XSS. And so if there's help I need with a blind XSS, then... Um, then I reach out to him. Um, Zayat on our team is also very good at, at XSS, particularly like bypassing uh, filters. Um, and so, yeah, we, ju- we just kind of know what each other's skill sets are and, and reach out on a, I guess, per need basis within, within the World Cup. So it's less, it's less like a, a traditional life hacking event in that we're not like teaming up to split bounties. It's just, oh, I need, I need somebody with this skill set on this asset here. Let's, let's collab. Um, but the cool thing about the World Cup is that we still get excited when the rest of our team finds uh, finds bugs and gets bounties because it means our team gets points. And so that's kind of a, yeah. a nice thing. Like I hear about two hackers finding something super cool, and I'm not getting any money for you know for it because I wasn't you know I wasn't helping. But I'm also happy because oh that means you know our team got was like 26 points for being you know if it's a critical it's like oh awesome I mean or our likelihood of advancing to the next round is much higher now because you two were collaborating. And as a bonus, you both got a bunch of money. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. That's, yeah. that's good. What, what you said for somebody finds something interesting, they post it and like everyone is happy and it's, it's like a crazy bugs as well. Cause with, with a bigger group, it's also naturally more bugs. So yeah, for, for me, yeah. it's the, the, the closest to, to, to what you said, cause I've never been the best sort of team collab. But most clubs that I did were, like you said, per need basis, where either somebody would reach out to me or I would reach out to somebody or I would reach out to some automation hackers to scale a zero day. And uh, yeah, so the, the uh, I, I see that, that for you, this is just uh, what you're doing the World Cup. Yeah, yeah. And your team, I uh, looked at the leaderboards, like Poland really crushed it uh this uh this yeah, first yeah, round so i think we, we might yeah we might be going i think we're fourth so we might be going head to head in a in a future round i don't think yeah, we're gonna yeah, we're not, not gonna not go to the group stage yet right now in the group stage so maybe we'll uh go head to head in in person if we both make it to the, the round of eight so, let's hope we're within the final i think i say <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> yeah <laughs> Now we just need to stage the drawing, but that that's easily hackable. <laughs> yeah. uh, I will go back a, a little bit to to the hacking part because I have a, a few questions that that are really bothering me, and and I, I kind of overlook them. Um, you find a lot of bugs, and some of them I imagine have uh, the company respond to you. You know, this is a single fix for all of these bugs, and we close all of them as as duplicates. Does it happen often? Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a whole meta game around this, right? Like this, especially when you're when your first couple reports to a program and you don't know it very well, you're gonna have two paths to go. Like, let's say you find two really similar vulnerabilities, you can take the the approach where you're gonna submit them both because they're say they're say they're two separate endpoints, but they're the same impact, right? Like it's a Say it's like an XSS on you know endpoint one and an XSS on endpoint two. You can submit them both, and and like really hope and push for them to be treated separately. But that risks them being closed as duplicate. On the other hand, you can submit one, then hope that they don't also look and find it on 
the second endpoint and then report it again, which if you, you know, if they fix the first one and then you report the second one, they can't say it's a duplicate because obviously they fixed one, but not the other. And so it's a, it's a real like gamble. And this kind of, it kind of makes the, the whole game fun. Right. Um, but I think as you, as you get to know a program, um, you kind of know what their, what their stance is on duplicates and how they, how they treat duplicates. But to be safe, what I love is when I can find a, like a third endpoint, which is not vulnerable. So that I can prove that these cannot be dupes because like, let's say you have endpoints A, B, and C and A and C are vulnerable, but endpoint B is not vulnerable. Then you can submit both A and C and then like in a note in them say, this is not a dupe. A is not a duplicate of C because clearly B is being handled in a, in a completely different way. And so these are, these are being, uh, the fix the fixes need to be individual because otherwise yeah. if these if a and c were duplicates then b would also be vulnerable and so if you can find a uh if you can find a a third endpoint that's really helpful uh what also i'll, I'll do is kind of on a similar vein could you, could is if i find a, a, a con concrete example with with some imaginary app of of this situation where you have two endpoints and then the third one that you could use to, to, to prove that it's not a dupe with like a real functionality too. So the viewers get the better, better image of what do you mean? Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. So let's say, let's say you've got an application and it says like a document application, which lets you like upload, upload documents. Um, and let's say that you find an XSS in the document name. And so like you can like upload a document with a malicious like title and it fires on other users. You also find that if your username um, is uh, has a XSS payload, it also has an XSS, and you know, it also like fires on users. But on that same page where those are both vulnerable, let's say that there's a like a document description field, which you try doing an XSS and it's not vulnerable. Then you could say, look, this is not a single fix on this page because you're doing sa you're sanitizing the the, the document description, and so it's not vulnerable, but the username and the title of the document are vulnerable. And so you can't say that these are these are one fix because you've got this third yeah. thing where it's already fixed. So if that's, yeah, I'm not sure if that, if that helps. Yeah, yeah, it does, thank you. How would you define a duplicate yeah. then? Like also you have the experience from the other side of the program. When is a duplicate mm -hmm. a duplicate? Is it a single fix that, that consists? Yeah, so historically, that's that's what it. I mean, that's that's what it is officially, and that's what it should be. Um, like, if if it's a single like line of code, and you make one change, then and it fixes it in multiple locations, then obviously that's that's a dupe. Um, uh, what where it gets dicey is what some companies will do is they'll be like, it'll be one fix, but you need to apply it multiple places, and so it might. Like you might need to, it might be one page that's vulnerable and the, the fix is the same on each, on each, uh, on each vulnerable page, but you're going to have to like be fixing multiple files. And so you can put in a fix for, you know, for, for page one and then push the change and it'll be fixed, but it won't be cha fixed for change two. However, they might be like, yeah. oh no, we just have to put the same change in, you know, page two, page three, page four, and they'll all get fixed and they'll call that one fix. It's like, no, it's one solution for multiple problems but they are they're all individual fixes and so it's you know this has been you know this this uh discussion is like tale as old as time right like we've been arguing this with with programs for for years and i think it's just going to come down to the maturity of the maturity of the program um and uh yeah ultimately at the end of the day bug bounty works because programs want to run bug bounty programs and so the the final say is always going to land on the program but i think that we can you know, make a pretty solid case when you're looking at something that's two separate you know clearly two separate issues i think an another area where it might get dicey is when you've got like a systemic issue and they're like okay we're not checking we're not <clears throat> we're not doing any authorization checks at all. It's all client side. And so any type of user can hit every single endpoint. And it's like, okay, is there's, you know, 65 different endpoints. Is that 65 different bugs? It's like, I, I, even as a hacker, I'd have a hard time like saying like, 
yeah, the 65 different bugs because it's you know, 65 different endpoints. When the bug is that there's just no authorization structure at all. And so, you know, maybe I think in those, in that case, I'd be like, okay, this is like one, like max critical, but you know, pay it as a max critical. But sure, if you if you need to like if the solution is just a completely like a complete rearchitecture of how you're doing your permission structure, then um, then sure, I'm fine with it being one fix. But it better be paid you know, appropriately. So, how would you report it if if let's say there was no authorization at all, and let's say you have twenty vulnerable endpoints? What, what do you do? And and it's yep. a fresh program, so I did no that. track record of them. Yeah. Um... So what I what I would if it's yeah that's a good uh, addendum um, if I if it's a fresh program and I have no uh, track record with them what I would do is I would report them all individually and then with a note on at the bottom of each one that says if these are like one fix please adjust the severity accordingly and so I might file like twenty mediums um, but if they are going to get duped together I want there to be a note in every single one that says. This, if this is a single fix, this is absolutely a, you know, a, a critical. So, because the last thing you want is for like twenty mediums to be duped into one medium. It was like, no, it's not yeah. a medium. Then it was a massive, massive problem. So, uh, and I actually did that hey, a while back. Uh, in um, well, I, I did this twice. So I had one program. It's my my number one program um, that I've filed the most bugs on. And I had a a pretty big architectural issue, and I reported it as all separate endpoints. They duped them all, and they did increase the severity to critical. And so I found a couple, like I think like a, a year later, I found another thing. And it was like, they had like a reporting feature where you could like generate reports. The admins could like generate reports, you know, about the data in their organization, like, you know, all users and all um, documents, et cetera. Um, and every single type of report was vulnerable to privilege escalation where a user that had access to no data could, or very little data could basically get every, you know, every bit of information by running every single type of report. And so because I had that track record in the past, I just like made a note at the very top, all caps, note to triage. Uh, I am. This is actually 15 different vulnerabilities. I am filing them as one, as one critical. You know, you know, treat this. Please don't downgrade this when, you know, because you're just like checking the CBSS box. And so I was like, okay. And so they, yeah, the the team handled it as a critical, and they were very appreciative that I didn't give them 15 different, you know, 15 different reports. They're just like, like, yep, it's one one holistic fix. There's no, there's no authorization on this reporting. Uh, reporting issue or report on these reporting endpoints, and yeah, I got my crit. Yeah, yeah. I wish we, as backhanders, we we had a way to know these things before interacting with a program. That let's say every program somehow defines very clear rules about things like these duplicates. Like maybe they they want you to submit one report and and they will increase this maybe maybe reward a bonus for each vulnerable endpoint, something like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it, it, it's it's painful that for things like that, for let's say reporting zero days as well, usually we have zero knowledge about what programs do with these. And and especially if you are to, to submit like 20 reports, that's a lot of work just submitting these reports. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it sucks if this this gets, you know, duplicates into one and, and it just adds work to, to everyone. Yeah, it does. It does. And I think that that's a really big draw to these bigger, mature programs that have like a, a big track record, like like uh, Amazon or Shopify or GitHub or Yahoo or PayPal or, you know, what, whatever, because they typically have matured to the point where they have policies that are pretty reliable. And if you find that they're deviating from their typical behavior you can point them back at old reports whether by reported by you or just disclosed reports and say no actually it looks like you know you're you treated this one as an individual report instead of a dupe then therefore can you look at, at this one instead and they're generally pretty open to to you know siding with you whereas if you have a brand new program who's like might still be kind of like wary of hackers and see us as as a adversaries 
you might have a harder time getting them to uh, be a bit more liberal with their with their budget. Yeah. Yeah. And another, let's say, bounty long discussion about the, is it the bag? Is it not the bag? Uh, UID is what happens if, if your bag requires the attacker to know the, the UID. Right. So, so UUIDs, I, mean, I, I will say UUIDs should absolutely be considered like valid vulnerabilities just with the attack scenario set to high or attack complexity set to high because it is very, you know, because people leave organizations, right? Like you may not be able to like yeah. brute force a, a UUID, but if you have an employee who like leaves your organization, like they, and they like wrote down what their you know, user UUID is, then they can, uh, then they can still affect, you know, still affect your company post termination. Um, additionally, there have been a number of times where I've, found oracles that basically render UUIDs uh, useless. Like I was hacking on a, this was a couple years ago and I was hacking on an application and every single ID was a UUID, right? So they're probably feeling really good about their security. Like there's no way you can brute force these UUIDs. Um, but there was one endpoint, one endpoint that leaked every single organization in the, in the application along with their UUID. And so if I had the organization's UUID, that I could go and hit the endpoint that requires the organization UUID and then returns all user UUIDs. And then now that I had the users UUIDs, I could then like modify other users or I could modify their documents or get a list of their documents, which would then have the document UUID. And so basically I had this cascading effect where just by that one endpoint, being able to see every single organization's UU, uh, UUID, I could, uh, uh, it, the fact that it was, UUID at all, it didn't matter because I could use that UUID to get any other UUID in this entire application. And so it was a, that was a very, very lucrative, uh, hacker one challenge for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think Uber for a long time just treated UUID as the prevention from IDERS. And I remember a blog post where there was an endpoint where you would just send the, the email of the user and the error that that would go back would not have the email, but it would have the UUID. Let's say user with UUID, this does not exist. And, and then the, the whole security was, was just broken. Yep. That's exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly that. Um, same, same thing. And so, yeah, you cannot you cannot rely on UUIDs because if a, if a UUID leak exists and they're, they're common, like they're, it, it is, there are oracles out there that just get you any type of UUID you need, then yeah. then you're, you're, security is just going to be, it's just going to be broken. And so I think in cases where there's no way to attain the UUID, like an or you don't have an Oracle or whatever, then it should still be valid. Just, I, I always expect the attack complexity to be set to high. Um, and that's kind of the way, the way that I think programs, uh, programs need to treat it. Yeah. I think since a few months at least hacker one has guidelines where it literally, it literally yep. says it should be like this. Um, so, so I guess if, if somebody of, of viewers reports an either or a privilege escalation that requires a UUID on hacker one, just refer to the hacker one guidelines to, to, you know, make your argument yep. that much stronger. Exactly. And you don't have to worry about the triage team and just shutting it down before it even gets to the eyes of eyes of the program. Is you know if the hacker one policy says this or guidelines says this, then the triagers are going to follow that. Yeah, yeah. You also yeah. I know from different interviews you like to to read documentation and and to maybe catch mm -hmm. catch some words in the documentation and use this to argue about some vulnerabilities. Whether some surprising bugs that you found that normally maybe you wouldn't report them. But the documentation clearly would would say that this should not be possible, and, and you still got paid for it. Yeah, I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna have a hard time thinking of a specific example, but I know that there's been a number of times on GitHub specifically that I've reported issues where, like the the documentation might say like this endpoint works on issues, but not pull like this a user should be able to can do this on issues, but not pull requests. And then I've been able to find a way to do it on pull requests because like internally issues and pull requests are the exact same thing. Like they're the exact same data type. They're just two types of, of an, of an issue. Like a pull request is an issue. And so that's been, I found a number of, uh, I've 
I think I report like two of them have been turned into CVEs, but there's been a number of, of issues I've found where a user can affect like pull requests, uh, but not issues or, or vice versa, or affect both of them when they, when the documentation says this only works on issues, does not work on pull requests. And then, oh, here's a way to, to get, get it to work on pull requests. Yeah. And yeah, GitHub is, uh, I think GitHub is very, very special also because the, the hashes, they work sort of the same hash works on different repositories. So even if you have a fork and you are on the main repository, if you use the hash of a fork, it also works. I don't know if, if issues and pull requests also share the same logic, but I think GitHub is very, very special. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Things. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. So. All that to say, documentation is awesome, and it is it is my best friend, especially when arguing like the validity of a bug, because they can't say if you can point to the documentation, put it like a square around it with a couple of arrows that point to it. You, you're like, you cannot tell me that this is not a bug because the documentation says this is a bug. And then they have their occasionally you'll have a program that's like, oh, our documentation needs to be updated, but it's like, okay, uh, typically they'll still pay for that. Like I know that. Uh, I think Salesforce pays for documentation bugs. Um, or yeah, or at least they did on the their most uh, most recent uh, live event. Where it was if they if there was something that was wrong in the documentation, then they would still pay you a couple hundred dollars for for that. And GitHub does that as well. If they I think if they need to make a documentation change, they'll they'll pay you for it. So it's not just like a it doesn't feel like a cop out or it doesn't feel like as much of a cop out to say. Oh, oops, you caught us. Let's just change the documentation instead of fixing the bug. It's like, okay, if it actually is a, if it actually is a documentation bug, whatever. But yeah, you still should get paid for, for that. Yeah. So when choosing a, a, a new program, I assume you, you take a look at the documentation, if it's, if it's, uh, extensive or not, what other things do you pay attention to when, when choosing a new program to hack on? Yeah, so this is kind of an evolving thing for me as I'm moving to full time. But what I what I generally like to do is when I'm sitting down to hack, if I haven't already decided the night before who I'm going to hack, is I will look at my my most recent uh, invites. And so I'll get you know when you're active on Hacker One, you'll get program invites pretty frequently, and they're always small programs. But I'll look at the the ones I've gotten most recently, and I'll just go through those, spend about usually like an hour or so, 30 minutes to an hour, um, just testing it and seeing like, okay, is do I think that there's going to be bugs here? Like, is this a complicated looking permission structure? Are there lots of IDs? Does this let people like self sign up and then like add people to their, to their organization? And, or is it just like a, is it just like an application where people can apply for like a credit check or apply for like a vehicle loan? It's like, okay, maybe that's not going to be as, as, uh, as fruitful. Um, and so after going through my new, like my, my list of new programs and saying, okay, these are the ones I'm going to hack. Um, after I've exhausted all those, I'll go back to a tried and true program. That's generally bigger that I have some, uh, experience on and know kind of their, their API and then I'll sit there until either I get like a live hacking event invite, which you know moves all of my focus to the live hacking event target, or I get like a new fresh invite that I that I take a look at. Yeah, and what do you look for after you you look through the the bugs that we've talked about today, which are authorization bugs, maybe payable bypasses? Because mm -hmm. on, on your top program, I see yeah. one hundred and sixty eight reports, so I assume that's yeah. that's quite a lot, a lot more. Yeah, so I, I also like to look for uh, things that are unique to that uh, application. So um, things like business logic errors. So maybe it's maybe it might not be vulnerable to IDORs or privilege escalations, but it might have like a like a feature that's really unique to them and a really unique, uh, I guess. A, a attack surface like maybe they maybe it's an application that really really cares about um pii like they really really don't want you to to know any users names and so if uh, if that's if that's the case about that application i'll go and i'll look through the different endpoints and just see where where can i 
get people's names? Is there any way to use use this application in a way that would leak name information? Or maybe it's an application where um, I'm going to have trouble thinking of like a specific scenario without giving something away. And so at the Capital One event, Capital One hacking event in, in Miami, the, the application that I was hacking on had a really unique attack surface and thing that they cared about, which was, uh, I mean, I, I can't talk about, about what it was, but it was a, there's something really unique about the target that I was hacking on for that, that Miami event. And so I just said, okay, you know, IDORs, whatever, privilege escalations, whatever, how can I accomplish this thing that this particular application really doesn't want me to do? And that's just where I spent spent all my time. Um, yeah. That is mostly technical, but because in, in one other interview, you said you cannot read JavaScript. Uh, so do you look for, for bugs, yeah, that, yeah. let's say, business logic bugs that, that <clears throat> usually involve maybe changing ID, changing a parameter like, like this, or are you also looking for these very technical bugs uh, so a lot my favorite bugs are the non-technical ones so i can talk i can talk about one uh, without giving the, the target away but i was hacking on this on the store application and there was a i wanted to find a way to get other users shipping addresses and so i was like looking at the the invoices i'm like okay is there a way to like there's a way to like buy things for other people on this application. And I was like, and have it shipped to them. But the, the address was obfuscated. And so I was like, Oh, there's gotta be a way to, there's gotta be a way to, uh, to get that, you know, to get some, that victim user's address by like buying something for them. And so, so what, uh, what me and my team did, I was working with a uh, space raccoon at the time, uh, and Alex Chapman, I believe, um, and what we did was we decided, okay, well, this this user is going to be our victim user. Here's their address. We'll just like put in a search filter on like Burp Suite, and then we went through every type of functionality we could think of. Like, okay, can we can we buy something for this person as like a gift, and then cancel it, and then maybe the cancellation notice will show like the shipping address. And eventually, we found a very obscure old piece of functionality which allowed, um, I, I guess I can't, can't go into too much detail without giving the program away, but uh, we found a very old piece of functionality which let you buy something for somebody in a non-traditional way. And then the invoice, when you did it that way, included the, the victim's shipping address. And so this wasn't using, like aside from just doing like a search filter on Burp, like this wasn't using like any any payloads. It wasn't modifying any IDs. We were just using the application with just a mouse and a keyboard, and we eventually found a way using some obscure old piece of functionality that I didn't even know existed at the time, like until then, to get pretty business critical information and or business critical information in that the uh, the business really cared about keeping users home addresses, you know, private. And so using this vulnerability, we were able to effectively leak the home address of every single user on the application, which was, yeah, yeah they, and they paid it out cool. as a critical. Yeah, that's a cool approach to, to just focus on one particular impact that you want to achieve, leaking a particular piece of information and, and focusing the, the efforts for some time on just doing this. I don't think I've ever done this. It sounds like, like so. I call that treasure. Hunt. I call it treasure hunting. Yeah, I, I call it, I call it treasure hunting, where it's like rather than looking just all across for vulnerabilities, you have like one piece of treasure that you're looking for, and you're just thinking, okay, how can I achieve X? And you just go all in on finding X. You might be ignoring like other vulnerabilities, but if you if you've identified that treasure that you want and you know it's going to pay a, pay a critical, then yeah, you just go all in on it and maybe spend a day or two and. Um, there's more than likely going to be going to be a way to achieve it. Maybe it'll be like a bit complicated and require some like user interaction, or maybe it will require having slightly elevated permissions. But there's there's going to be a way to to find that treasure. Yeah, and for sure you you, you come up with more ideas when you're focused on one goal rather than when you just hunt normally and look for other functionality and look for let's say more or less the same ideas that you do in different apps. 
Uh, but when you when you have just you know I want to leak this, I imagine you do much more different things to to achieve this, and and that that sounds like a perfect way to to find bugs that others would would miss. Exactly, exactly, and it's just so rewarding, right? When you finally when you finally found it, like when we finally leaked that address, it was it was so sad, it was so satisfying because just yeah. because the impact was so big, you know, being able to get find out where anybody lives that uses the application office oh, it, it was so cool yeah uh, one concept i want to talk about i saw on your, on your blog post and i really really liked it is the concept of embedded hackers and i'd like all potential program managers or people from platforms to to hear about this so can you please talk about what you meant in that blog post Yes, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to because this, this had come up just recently, a situation where I really wish this was the case. So there's there's times where you go really, really deep on an application. Like I know that you are really familiar with that application that you were telling me about over, over Twitter DMs where you found your bug. And sometimes the application has a lot of functionality and it's really complex. What's really, really frustrating is filing a report on something that you know, like you know the application like the back of your hand, you know how to use it, the program really knows it. And so all you need to say is, yeah, just like make a user, set them as this type of user, and then hit this endpoint. But then you like triage comes in as because the company program is paying for triage and they don't know the application like you do. They don't know the application like the, the program does. And so they're going to say, okay, you say you make this a user with this, this level of permissions. Can you tell me how to make a user? Can you tell me how to to create this document that you say you need to be able to create to exploit the vulnerability? Can you, can you tell me how to create an organization? And it's like, you have to kind of give them a primer on how to use the application to even find your bug. When you know, the program knows, the only person who doesn't know is the triager. And so what I, my concept of embedded hackers is to let programs choose specific hackers that they like the reports, they trust them, to and just have that those hackers reports be you know, bypass the triage process because you know maybe uh you know maybe they know like this particular program that i i've got 168 reports on i just had to like put out a response of to a triager to explain how to use the app how to use the application and how to sign in as a specific type of user and it was frustrating because like i know how to do it and the program knows how to do it and so if this program can say Yes, Douglas Day or Archangel has submitted 168 reports to us. He knows how to use the application. Just make sure his report. You know, he, I'm not, I'm not going to submit garbage. I'm not going to submit reports that aren't valid. I've submitted 168 reports already. It's like I, my report should be able to go directly to the program. And so this benefits triage because they're not having as much work to do, and they can focus on their their efforts on uh, programs that need the help. It benefits me because I don't have to wait as long, and it benefits the program because if I'm like submitting a critical uh, vulnerability that they really care about, then they can get it faster and they can fix it faster. Like the last thing I want is for like uh, a program like um, I'm, I, I don't know. I think I think PayPal uses uses HackerOne's triage, but you know, the last thing I want is for you know PayPal to um, get like a critical or, you know vulnerability reported on. You know, reported by a hacker who maybe is knows PayPal very well and is very trusted, but then you know the the vulnerability is complicated or the the functionality is complicated, so that and it takes longer for them for the vulnerability to get to PayPal because you know triage is just having to kind of understand how this particular piece of functionality works. So by <clears throat> by having programs just opt in specific hackers to bypass the triaging process, I think it would make all all people happy. <laughs> Yeah. Were we able to implement this as Elastic? Uh, unofficially, um, the HackerOne platform didn't have anything native, but when we saw like reports come in from uh, hackers that we had trusted, like particularly like DC um, was one of our big, our big hackers, um, Dominic. He's based in Ireland now, I think. Um, but he, uh, whenever we saw, see something coming from him, we just grab it out of the queue because, you know, Elastic is a complicated piece of functionality or complicated piece of technology. Um, I don't expect triagers to know how to use Elastic Search. Um, and so 
if uh, but you know DC Dominic knows how to use Elasticsearch. We know how to use Elasticsearch, and so he submitted something to us. I didn't want there to be a delay because a triager does not use Elasticsearch. Yeah, yeah, I really like the concept, and I think it's especially annoying with open source targets, which which I like to hack on. Because then often I have to explain to the treasurer how to even set up the application. And, and once they get through this, sometimes they will ask questions. Let's say recently I submitted a report that I was not sure what the company will say about it because it was quite, quite a complex one. So I was like, I don't know if, if you want to triage this or not. But the thing is the questions that triager was asking me after they, they set up the application. The, the questions they were asking me about the bug were not the questions that, that were bothering me and I knew that will will be important for the company whether this bug is, is valid or not in their particular setup. And uh, yeah, so I really like this concept. I would love this this to be implemented. And also one, one more thing is when talking to a program, I feel like we can very well communicate uh, through the source code on the on the source open source application. When I show to the program the, the source code, you know, here's the vulnerable piece of code, here is why this works, they will understand it and, and perhaps they don't even have to to reproduce the bug. Maybe for, for the sanity they, they want to reproduce the bug, but they will see the source code and they will know why the bug is there. And the triager usually, you know, goes pre pre needs to to actually verify this, which is just time consuming. You know, I'm not saying anything bad bad because I know setting up the application is really difficult sometimes. But I just think I shouldn't be the person that helps the triager to to do this. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I have to ask, as as an open source hacker, have you done like the ultimate flex and written a like a PR? fix to go with your report um no no i didn't i didn't do this <laughs> yeah um, it, i just i sometimes fantasize about about doing that and how cool it would look to be like here's your bug also here's the fix <laughs> so i, I did not uh, submit a pr but once i was submitting a, a zero day we were collab collaborating i think with nagli to report a zero day across different programs mm. And in the report, I would give the monkey patch to, to the uh, client using the, the target application. So that was the, the closest that I did, but never actually did, did a fix. I would be happy to, to suggest a fix if there was additional incentive, but just for, for, the, for, the, for fun of it. No, I didn't, didn't, never did it. Okay, I will be heading to to end our conversation. So uh, did I understand correctly? Today is 9th July, 9th July, and you, from the beginning of August, you will be a full-time bug bounty hunter. Uh, I don't know, I'm a, a full-time uh, bug bounty hunter now as of uh, Ju June 26, I think. Oh, okay. So, so been, been, been a full-time full bug bounty hunter for a couple weeks, yeah. How is it going? Uh, yeah, I think it's going. I think it's going well. There's some challenges and changes that I'm, I'm getting used to. Um, namely, it's very difficult to judge my productivity um, based on like a dollar amount because I could say like, yeah, I worked eight hours today, and you know maybe I got you maybe I found three bugs, but those bugs might not get paid until next month. And so, do I to kind of have metric? Excuse me, have metrics around how well I'm doing. Do I total the amount of bounties I'm getting paid each week, or do I total the number of bugs that I'm getting finding each week and reporting, which may or may not be paid? And so I could I could keep track of okay, I got paid you know ten thousand dollars in bounties this week, but those ten thousand dollars might have been like from bugs that I reported like the like a month ago, and so I don't. Yeah. It's really difficult to keep track of okay. How, how productive am I being? How do I need to change? What do I need to to adjust to to make sure that I'm like meeting my meeting my bounty quotas? And that's kind of been a, a very interesting very interesting change is yeah you know, keeping track of of how I'm doing uh, money wise. So that's kind of the the biggest challenge uh, that and uh, <clears throat> as I kind of delve more into consulting, uh, having appropriate bound uh, boundaries with and expectations with with customers that i'm i'm doing consulting and pen testing with um and you know not 
necessarily responding to like emails in the middle of the night, um, even though they're from somebody who's expecting a, a pen test report soon. So yeah, that's kind of the a couple of challenges, but obviously the the benefits outweigh the 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 negatives. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to to interview again in, in a year or two and, and see what things from the mm-hmm. life of a full time background hunter surprised you the most, what was exactly as you expected them. What, what changed? Did you actually develop the automation? Uh, I think it would be really, really fun to to see what changed after after going full time. Yeah, that'll be fun. Like uh, July of next year, see how I'm doing. Maybe I'll be maybe I'll be back in a job, or maybe I'll have uh, started my own company. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of a I'm taking a risk. But I mean, the best things in life require risk. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, and people, if if we don't if we don't publish it 2025 by let's say by the end of July, you can ping us on on Twitter too. <laughs> <laughs> so that we we record this this interview for now douglas thank you so much for the interview i wish you all the best in your full-time back bounty hunter journey thanks greg yeah this has been a real treat a pleasure talking with you as always and uh good luck to your team in the world cup and we'll uh we'll see you in the finals yeah see, see you in the finals <laughs> bye <laughs> bye if you've learned something new in this episode just go and test it on the real website because i know for a fact that it works. But if you can't do it right now, I recommend you to listen to this episode with David Schultz. For now, thank you for listening and goodbye.